Hello, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on which part of the globe you're calling from. Uh, thanks for joining the 24-hour stem cell virtual conference. Today, Shantanu and myself from Synthetic Biology R&D team at Thermo Fisher Scientific, we would uh, share with you the uh, highly efficient genome editing and cell engineering uh, applications in stem cells using CRISPR-Cas9. So today's topic will be divided into two parts. Um, I will first uh, walk you through the uh, different genome editing technologies and give you a little bit background, uh, and then focus more on the CRISPR-Cas9 system, uh, and then give you more details on the latest developments that we have done in this area. Following which, uh, Shantanu will cover uh, application data and stem cells. Let's look at what genome editing is. So it's an approach whereby a genomic DNA sequence within a gene in a cell type of interest can be directly changed by adding a new piece of DNA sequence, replacing or removing DNA bases. And if you look at the different applications of genome editing, one could use this for very basic studies like studying a gene function. You can knock down a gene by removing DNA bases or you can revert a gene mutation in a disease phenotype to a wild-type phenotype. You could also do more sophisticated applications like tagging an endogenous gene with reporter genes or a promoter of your choice, for example, an inducible promoter. One could also use this for engineering the cells and thereafter use it in tissue engineering or model system generations. Another powerful application of genome editing tools is that we can now create paid isogenic disease models. If you look at traditional, uh, much older methods, uh, what was done before was one would derive iPSCs from a healthy control, differentiate that into a wild-type somatic cell type, and then compare it with the cell types uh, derived from iPSCs obtained from a diseased control patient. So what you're dealing with here is in addition to the phenotypic changes that you want to compare between this wild type and disease condition, you're also now working with two different genetic backgrounds. So with genome editing, what you can now do is you can take a wild type uh, human uh, pluripotent stem cells, edit the uh, particular gene of interest, and derive the mutant uh, cell type. And now you can differentiate these wild-type and mutant uh, iPSCs uh, into the respective somatic cell types of choice and compare the phenotypes between the disease and the wild-type state. The beauty here is what you're looking at, the only change that you're looking at is the edit in that genome and you're working in the same genetic background. So there are different... Um gene editing technologies that one can leverage for engineering their genome. Some of the traditional methods, like meganucleases, they were based on engineered restriction enzymes. Uh, while they're highly specific, it was very cumbersome to design these, especially because the DNA binding domain and the cleavage activities are highly intertwined. Then came the zinc finger nucleases and talons. These were engineered DNA binding uh, domains fused to non-specific nuclease domain like FOC1. So here again, while these are relatively easier than meganucleases, what one needs to do, just like the meganucleases, is that every time you have a new target sequence to edit, you will have to re-engineer the protein molecule. Then came a very interesting and uh, technology, the CRISPR-Cas9, very elegant system. Here, the target specificity is defined only by a short non-coding RNA. So this system is a Cas9 endonuclease-mediated DNA cleavage that is directed by a short non-coding RNA. All one needs to engineer each time they have a new sequence to edit is a short 18 to 20 nucleotide region within the non-coding RNA molecule. I'll describe this in a little more detail in my next slide. So let's look at what happens within the cell once you administer these editing tools. So once the target-specific region is identified by the gene-engineered uh, nuclease, a double-stranded cleavage is created at the specific site, following which the cell repair mechanism can be leveraged to induce gene edits. There are two major repair mechanisms that are shown here, non-homologous end-joining repair mechanism, which is an error-prone method of repairing the cleaved ends. 
in the process of this repair mechanism, frame shift mutations can be induced thereby creating knock gene knockouts. Another repair mechanism listed here is the homology-driven repair mechanism. Here, you can uh, incorporate or provide an uh, exogenous piece of DNA carrying your desired function encoded within the sequence change that you have made, and then flank this specific sequence with homology arms that are matching to the flanking sites at the double-stranded cleavage. Once you've uh, designed the appropriate donor DNA, now you can add this new functionality into the specific loci of your choice. By using, by leveraging this mechanism, you can tag endogenous genes with novel promoters, or you could also tag the genes with reporter genes. So let's look uh, at a closer look at the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. The technology that we use is based off of the Streptococcus pyogenes CRISPR-Cas system. In bacteria, this particular system confers resistance against exogenous piece of DNA, like, for example, the viral DNA or plasmid DNA. <coughs> this particular system has been leveraged by scientists to perform genome editing in a wide variety of organisms, including zebrafish, Drosophila, and more complex systems like humans and mouse. If you take a closer look at this, there are two key components. The Cas9 endonuclease protein, which drives the uh, catalytic activity, and the guide RNA component, which is a chimera between a target-specific CRISPR RNA and a constant component, the tracer RNA. The guide RNA component in this system drives the target specificity and the endonuclease activities encoded within the Cas9. Within the cell, the guide RNA and Cas9 forms the effector complex and uh, finds the specific target sequence within the genome and then induces the double-stranded cleavage. For this double-stranded cleavage to occur, one of the key requirements is an NGG PAM site. The PAM sites are different for different CAS, CRISPR-Cas systems. Since we are using the Streptococcus pyogenes system, the PAM site here is the NGG. And once you've identified the respective PAM site, then you identify the 20 nucleotides that are unique upstream of this NGG to your genomic process interest. And that would be the exact sequence that would be the uh, sequence for the CRISPR RNA. Once the uh, Cas9 guide on the complex finds the uh, respective target loci containing the suitable PAM site, then the Cas9 molecule induces a double-stranded cleavage. And thereafter, cells repair mechanism is leveraged for uh, editing, either using the non-homologous enjoining uh, repair mechanism or the homology-driven repair mechanism. If you look at the uh, genome and cell engineering workflow from designing the genome editing tool to analyzing the cleavage efficiencies of these gene editing tools, there are three main steps. Designing uh, a target-specific genome editing tool, delivering it into the cell type of choice, and detecting and analyzing the efficiencies uh, downstream. And there are several different factors to consider to uh, do successfully edit your cell. First, making sure that the target sequence that you want to edit is specific and unique, uh, and design an editing tool that is uh, complementary to that region, and then delivering these editing tools into the cell. And there are various things that need to happen in the cell. They have to enter the uh, cytoplasm and then make its way into the nucleus, and the effector complex needs to identify the unique target region and then following which the double-stranded cleavage can be generated. There are uh, certain other factors uh, that also play a major role. The target loci accessibility, the chromatin structure at that site, um, the cell type that you're working with, and uh, based on the cell type, you need to choose a specific delivery reagent that is suitable for the editing tool that you're using and the cell type of choice, and various other culturing conditions. And these are all critical factors for a successful gene editing experiment. Before I get into more details on how to design the guide RNA and deliver the Cas9 
Gaidami complex into the cell, I would like uh, to show you different detection methods that one could use because most of the data that I show here is based off of these assays. There are several different assays, gene or genomic cleavage detection assay, or uh, reporter-based uh, systems that are used for enriching the edited clones. One could also use genotyping assays like Pacman SNP assays. Uh, we could also leverage sequencing-based methods to identify the specific sequence at the indel locations. It's the assay that I would be uh, using in most of the results that are shown in the rest of this uh, talk is based off of the genomic cleavage detection assay. So let me walk you through this process in a little more detail in my next slide. So the, uh, this particular assay that we have developed is a very elegant way of monitoring the efficiencies of your specific target-specific gene editing tool. Um, and this, uh, what we have here in this kit is all the reagents needed to efficiently measure the cleavage activity at the target loci of interest. The way this works is following transfection of, say, for example, the target-specific CRISPR-Cas9, uh, you, uh, uh, after 48 hours post-transfection, you can harvest the cells and lyse them. Following lysis, you can perform PCR using uh, primers that flank the uh, specific loci of choice and generate amplicons. If you look at the pool of amplicons that you derive from the cell population, you have a mixture of amplicons that are derived from the edited cell and also those amplicons that have been derived by the unedited cells within the population. The next step then is to denature and re annule the PCR amplicons. In this step, uh, what, would, uh, what you would generate is a heteroduplex um, that would arise by uh, the template containing a particular indel type pairing with another template that has a different indel type or a template containing a specific indel pairing up with a wild type unedited template. Now these mismatches create a bubble within the amplicons. In the next step, using the mismatch recognition enzyme within the kit, you can then um, generate cleaved products that would cleave only the heteroduplexes, leaving behind the homoduplex pairs. Now, when you run this uh, cleaved products on the gel, what you would see is in cases of samples that did not receive the uh, editing reagent, you would get an uh, uncut band. And those samples that received the specific target specific uh, guide RNAs or CRISPR RNA system, you will see uh, uh, the, cut, uh, the percent uh, cut band on the gel would be. Uh, proportional to the efficiencies of the gene editing tool. So very elegant method. Within less than five hours, you can um, identify, uh, compare the efficiencies between the different guide RNAs or CRISPR RNAs that you would have designed for your specific loci of interest and choose the one that is a high performer. So uh, walked you through the Cas9 technology and the uh, assay systems that we use to measure the uh, cleavage efficiencies uh, once the cells are edited with the CRISPR-Cas9. Now let's look at how to design the target-specific guide RNA. The different guide RNA formats that one can use. One can express the guide RNA off of a, a DNA plasmid or express the guide RNA from a synthetic double-stranded DNA template containing a U6 promoter that can be used for endogenous expression of the guide RNA within the cell, or use a synthetic DNA containing T7 promoter to synthesize in vitro transcribed guide RNAs in vitro. Uh, you could also use guide RNA synthesis kits to generate purified guide RNA. And I'll walk you through one of the methods that we have developed uh, here within Thermo Fisher Scientific. You could also um, obtain purified, ready-to-use guide RNA libraries, which can come as in vitro transcribed uh, guide RNAs or lengthy viral guide RNA libraries. So uh, what we have done here is we have developed a CRISPR design tool that can be accessed to the Thermo Fisher Cloud to design your target-specific guide RNAs. Before I walk you through that, I would like to show you how to identify the unique regions within the genome. So the key component within the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology is designing a unique guide RNA that's specific for your target of interest. 
To do this, what we need to do is first find a PAN site within the target site. Shown in, uh, in this example are potentially five different PAN sites here. And uh, to design the CRISPR RNA, you would then pick the 20 nucleotide spacer sequence upstream of the PAM, and that would be the exact sequence that codes for the CRISPR RNA. While there are five potential types, the key thing to keep in mind is to make sure that you pick the target or spacer region that is unique to your loci and isn't present elsewhere in the genome. To make these designing simple, we have uh, we, we offer a design tool through our Thermo Fisher cloud set, and I'll walk you through that in my next couple slides. So the CRISPR design tool, as I mentioned, is available on the Thermo Fisher cloud. Um, this tool uh, is a neat design to ordering system where one can input their uh, gene name or gene ID and select the CRISPR format for the uh, specific host genome of interest. Currently, we have uh, two species options. Either the, uh, you could choose the human genome or the mouse genome. There are two ways one can use this tool to design their specific guide RNA. You can input your gene uh, name or the gene ID, and uh, once you select the CRISPR format in the search button, then you would be directed uh, to the, um, uh, the guide RNA design page in the next window where, you, where the different guide RNAs for that particular genome will be listed. And this is chosen from the uh, wide collection of the guide RNAs that we have in the database. One could also input a gene sequence and then uh, select the custom design option, in which case what you will then have is the guide RNA specific for that sequence that you have uh, uh, input here in this, uh, on this web page. And once you have uh, selected the search button, it takes you to the next window that lists uh, potential guide RNAs for that particular gene or sequence that you have chosen. So once you have selected the, uh, uh, the particular gene of choice, then you are provided with different guide RNA, CRISPR uh, guide RNA options. And if you uh, uh, hover over the specific uh, CRISPR RNA sequence, what, you, uh, what is also displayed on the top uh, uh, box, what's shown is the orientation of the CRISPR and the number of CRISPRs uh, that are available for that particular sequence of gene of choice. In addition, there are several other features that are available. You can select the uh, column that's labeled as binding site, and then you can look at different potential off-target binding sites for that particular CRISPR. And you could also design the gene art cleavage detection uh, assay primers that are needed to amplify the edited loci within your cell population. What this tool does is we automatically recommend the top uh, three to four guide RNAs. Uh, while, while we recommend four, there are several instances where uh, one of the first two could work. The reason we are recommending uh, at least three to four guide RNAs is because uh, the efficiencies of the CRISPR truly depends on the cell type and the availability of that particular loci within the cell. In case of uh, the guide, uh, the GCD primers for cleavage detection assay, um, uh, again, for each of the CRISPR that you have chosen, you would be provided with a primer pair. Once you have selected the CRISPR and the GCD primers that you would need, you hit the um, Add CRISPR uh, button, and then all of these components, along with the CRISPR Cas9 formats and the recommended reagents, will be added to your cart. As I mentioned, this tool gives you the flexibility to design the guide RNA for your genomic loci of interest and also uh, order the uh, reagents that are needed for your CRISPR-based genome editing. So the next step after identifying your target specific CRISPR RNA region is to synthesize the specific guide RNA. There are several different methods, as I mentioned earlier, to express the guide RNA within your cell. You can either transfect directly a synthetic RNA oligo that's specific for your target specific region. One of the biggest challenges with this method is that it's uh, relatively much more expensive. Also, uh, it is prone to errors. Another method is to express the guide RNA by transfecting a plasmid. 
The challenge here that you encounter is it's a labor-intensive process to design the plasmid, and also there is a concern for random integration. And the method that we uh, chose to move forward with is to design uh, and synthesize purified in vitro transcribed guide RNAs for transient expression. Uh, to generate in vitro transcriptions, we tested several different methods. We, uh, we chose to use long overlapping oligos, but one of the challenges that we saw here was with the increased length in oligos beyond 40 nucleotides, so we started seeing more uh, errors within the oligos. So then we uh, decided to test double-stranded synthetic DNA fragments as template for in vitro transcription. The challenge here is the uh, increased delivery time and the cost per target. The other approach that we tested was uh, using linearized plasmids and PCR products as a template for in vitro transcription. One of the key concerns that we had here was the time that involved in preparing these templates. Finally, we settled down on uh, the method that I would be describing now. This improved guide RNA synthesis protocol is now being developed into a kit that provides, provides all the reagents to assist you with a rapid and robust workflow that can synthesize purified guide RNAs in less than four hours. So the first step is to design your guide RNA template. In your template, you have the five prime region um, that has in vitro transcription promoter, in this case, the T7 promoter, followed by the 20 base, the target specific region that you would have designed using the tool, and then the constant 80 nucleotide tracer RNA coding region. Uh, within the guide RNA synthesis kit, we provide an oligo pool that contains all the constant components. All one needs to do then is to design the target specific forward and reverse oligo pair. Um, please note that in the forward primer, what we have in addition to the target specific region is at the five prime end, this oligo matches to the T7 promoter constant region. In case of the reverse primer, the 5 prime region has an overlapping region with the constant 80 nucleotide tracer region. And these uh, overlapping regions were incorporated to facilitate the PCR assembly. Now, using the PCR assembly enzymes provided in the kit, you can then generate double-stranded DNA in less than two hours. These products are nice and clean, so it doesn't require any intermediate purification step. We can directly be then taken into the in vitro transcription reaction. We also have provided all the enzymes needed for in vitro transcription in this uh, kit. With the process described here, we can get greater than 10 micrograms of guide RNA at the concentration of minimum 200 nanograms per microliter. So all in all, this is a very robust and rapid method to synthesize your guide RNA, and it's also high throughput and amenable. You can order oligos in 96-well format and then uh, go through this process and synthesize 96 different guide RNAs in less than four hours. So here is an example from uh, an experiment that we did in U2OS Cas9 stable expressing cell line. We synthesized um, uh, purified guide RNAs using the method I just described for 13 different kinase genes along with an HPRC guide RNA control. Um, and an irrelevant negative control that did not have a respective PAM site within the cell. So what, uh, what's shown here is um, uh, the percentage cleavage efficiencies using the GNR cleavage detection assay. So in every case, for example, in these kinase sets, for uh, each gene we designed two guide RNAs, T1 and T2. So you will notice that in any case, uh, we have at least one target giving greater than 40% cleavage efficiency. So what we have with this new robust method is a protocol that will help you design guide RNAs at a much higher throughput scale and also get robust cleavage efficiencies with minimal toxicity. Now let's look at the different delivery formats for Cas9. So Cas9 can be expressed off of a plasmid or delivered into a cell as a purified Cas9 mRNA or purified Cas9 protein. In cases of cells that are really difficult to transfect, like non-dividing cells, one could leverage lentiviral-based systems. What I will show you in the next slide is a comparison between the Cas9 plasmid mRNA protein system. Now let us look at each of these uh, formats that I've described earlier and see what needs to happen within the cell for successful delivery and gene editing. First, in case of the uh, 
This for Cas9 DNA plasmid system, the DNA has to make its way through the cell wall into the cytoplasm, then into the nucleus, transcribe the into Cas9 mRNA and the in vitro transcribed guide RNA. Thereafter, the uh, mRNA transcripts are translated to Cas9 protein, which then has to find the respective uh, target specific guide RNA, form the effector complex, and then enter into the nucleus. So there are several different processes that has to go through uh, with, uh, with the Cas9 plasmid format. In case of mRNA, it's much more simpler. You now have the ability to control the dosage of the mRNA to guide RNA in vitro, and then once you provide the suitable uh, ratios within the cell, in the cytoplasm, the Cas9 mRNA now is translated into a protein. It then finds the guide RNA, and now the complex is ready for acting within the nucleus. Even better with the Cas9 protein purified system, the beauty here is you can now pre-complex the Cas9 protein and guide RNA in vitro outside the cell and control the dosage. Now this complex is ready to act within the cell at the target specific loci inside the nucleus. So what this means is with the uh, Cas9 DNA system, there are several different processes that the cell has to go through, whereas in, um, in case of the Cas9 RNP system, the complex is ready to act at the, within the nucleus. So the next thing that we um, wanted to see is we want to compare the activities with DNA, mRNA, and Cas9 protein formats. Um, more importantly, we wanted to look at the levels of Cas9 uh, expression within the cell. So what we did is, here is an experiment in 293FTs using the three different uh, Cas9 formats. We optimized the amount of Cas9 um, uh, using these two form, uh, these three different formats to get uh, relatively similar amounts of cleavage efficiency so that we can compare the expression levels. On the left side is the data from the uh, cleavage detection assay. As you can notice, with all these three formats, we see cleavage as early as eight hours, and the cleavage maximizes by 48 hours. In contrast, when we looked at the Western blot, what we notice is in case of mRNA and the Cas9 protein system, we see an early boost of the protein, and slowly the protein clears out of the system with, uh, uh, with no uh, protein detectable after 48 hours. However, in case of the DNA system, you will notice that slowly the expression level of the protein increases and peaks at 24 hours, and you still have large excess of protein even at 72 hours. Uh, so this could be one of the reasons why DNA is uh, having more potential off-target activity compared to Cas9 mRNA or protein. So the, as long as the DNA is available within the cell, the protein is formed, and it's uh, following the cleavage at the intended target site, now the protein is available to go and bind elsewhere in the genome. And to test this, we did an experiment to compare the off-target activity uh, between the three formats. For the off-target experiments, very similar to the earlier um, data that I showed, we optimized the dosage of the DNA, mRNA, and protein to give similar cleavage efficiency at the on-target site. In this case, we are testing the VEGF target. So this particular on-target, uh, the, the target that we chose had two potential off-target sites, and shown on the left side is the sequence information for the on-target as well as the off-target sites. Highlighted in bold and underlined are the mismatched nucleotides compared to the on-target sequence. If you look at the uh, DNA, mRNA, and protein system, you will notice that for the off-target site T2, you have much more activity at that site with the DNA compared to the on-target site, whereas uh, the mRNA and protein has much uh, lesser activity at this particular site compared to the on-target. In case of the off-target T18 with DNA, we still saw high levels of cleavage efficiency, very similar to the on-target site, whereas we did not see any detectable activity with either the Cas9 mRNA or protein format. The next thing we wanted to check was if we increase the amount of purified Cas9 protein, would we see increased levels of off-target with the Cas9 protein format? As you can see on the right side, 
with increased dose responses, we did not see any increased activity at the off-target site T2. And one of the attractive uh, applications of this CRISPR-Cas9 technology is the ability to multiplex knockout in a much more um, uh, robust manner. So to test the efficiency of multiplexing knockout using Cas9 RMP system, we did experiments in JURCA T cells. In this experiment, we designed and synthesized purified guide for three different genes, AVS1, RELA, and HPRT. Um, then pre-complexed this guide RNA with the Cas9 protein, purified protein, to form the Cas9 RNP complex in vitro. Upon um, making these complexes, we then delivered these into the JURCA T cells using neon electroporation system. On the left side is the uh, data from the GNOT cleavage detection assay, wherein we're looking at the cleavage uh, efficiency at the respective target flow size. For each of these uh, targets, we got greater than 60% cleavage efficiency. What that now means is we have raised the chances of uh, multiplex knockout efficiencies. So then we wanted to look at the uh, triple knockout experiments. On the right side is the data from this experiment where the blue bars represent the data from the wild cyclone, and the red bars represent the homozygous double knockout, and the green represents the heterozygous clones. So in this experiment, post-transfection, we uh, performed single cell clone of isolation and sequenced each of those clones to measure percent indel efficiency. As you can see in this bar graph, when we did simultaneous gene knockout for all these three gene loci in parallel, we got, uh, uh, from the clones that we have identified, we did not get even a single wild-type clone and greater than 60% of the clones isolated had double um, uh, knockout for each of these genes that we were addressing. So what this means is, now, um, if you are uh, doing multiplexing knockout with Cas9 RNP, you have uh, a high chance of getting your clones with triple knockouts. Most uh, uh, diseases, complex diseases, are uh, involve multiple genes. So in order to create these complex disease models, it's very important to have an efficient mechanism to create these knockouts in parallel. So with the Cas9 RNP system, uh, we, you can now, um, you're now enabled to generate uh, knockout cell lines in, uh, in parallel for the different genes of your interest or choice. In addition to uh, optimizing the um, neon-based electroporation for Cas9 RNP system, we also looked at the delivery of the Cas9 RNP using transfection reagents. And in the process, we have developed a Cas9 RNP-specific transfection reagent called CRISPR-Max. And we have tested this in a broad variety of cell types. And with this reagent, you can address delivery in most of the cell types we have tested, and it gives superior performance compared to other transfection reagents that we have tested in our hands. And what you would notice here is in some cases, for example, mouse embryonic stem cells, the cleavage efficiencies when we tested with neon-based approach or the CRISPR-Max were very similar. In IPSCs, we get very robust cleavage efficiencies using the CRISPR-Max reagent compared to any other transfection reagent that we have tested. And with neon-based electroporation system, we can increase the cleavage efficiency even further. But in cases of the uh, relatively hard to transect cell lines or suspension cell lines, what we have noticed is neon-based electroporation using Cas9 RNP is a much more robust system than other options that we have uh, uh, assessed here. So all in all, what we have here is with the Cas9 RNP and the RNP-specific transfection reagent or the neon-optimized protocol you will be now able to address gene editing in a multiple different cell types of your choice. So that uh, brings to the end of this part of the talk. So I've shared with you a robust mechanism to design and synthesize in vitro transcribed guide RNAs in less than three to four hours. And in combination with the Cas9 uh, protein format and the um, Lycofactamine, CRISPR-Max, or neon electroporation optimized protocols, one can 
design the guide RNA and do cleavage analysis in their cell type of choice in less than a week. With that, I would like to thank you and pass on this uh, the talk to Shantanu Kumar, my colleague, who will be sharing some data uh, that we generated for IPSCs and ESCs using the different formats that I've discussed with you earlier during this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Namrita, for describing various formats of CRISPR-Cas9 and workflow for genome editing. Hello, everyone. My name is Shantanu Kumar, and I am an R&D scientist in the Department of Synthetic Biology at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Today, I will be sharing some of our recent work to demonstrate highly efficient genome editing in a stem cell using CRISPR-Cas9. In next slide, I will talk about the stem cell and engineering. You may ask why is stem cell engineering? Before I answer this question, let me briefly explain regarding the stem cells. As you may know, there are two kinds of stem cells. One picture to your left is adult stem cells, which are derived from tissue or organs. Adult stem cells are limited in their differential potentials. For example, hematopoietic stem cell that can give rise to all the lineages of blood, such as T cell, B cell, NK cell, macrophages, etc. Picture to your right is induced pluripotent stem cell, or iPSCs, which is derived from a donor cell after reprogramming. iPSCs are very similar to embryonic stem cell as they can give rise to all the cell type of human body. What about engineering these two different stem cells? Engineering of both cell types are very important as they can provide useful information regarding development and diseases. Theoretically, both cell types can be engineered, but in practice, IPC are relatively easy to engineer compared to adult stem cells. There are many reasons for these differences. Number one, most of the adult stem cells are quiescent, meaning it is difficult to grow them in culture, whereas IPSC are highly proliferative and can be maintained indefinitely in culture. Number two, adult stem cell chromatin is less accessible, therefore it is difficult to manipulate them, whereas IPSC chromatin is open and readily accessible for genome manipulation. Next, I will talk about disease modeling using stem cells. This slide describes about application of genome editing tool in creating patient-specific disease models using primary and iPSCs. Top picture describes about genome engineering-based HIV therapies. CCR5 is expressed on CD4 positive cells and Natural variant of CCR5 confers resistant to HIV infection. Recently, researchers modify CCR5 using CRISPR and TALS and infuse modified autologous CD4 positive T cell to the patient. Clinical trials are, trials are ongoing to demonstrate the efficacy and safety of these studies. Bottom picture describes the utility of genome editing tool for generating isogenic cell lines. Isogenic cells have similar genomic and epigenomic signature, meaning it is derived from single donor. For example, if you would like to study the effect of a mutation for disease modeling, first we need to generate an iPSC line from healthy person, as shown in bottom left, and use iPSC line and genome editing tool to generate the mutant iPSC line and then differentiate both healthy and mutant iPSC line into a specific cell type for in vitro disease modeling. Similarly, patient cells can be used for generating isogenic cell lines, as shown in the bottom right. In next slide, I will describe about ESC, in particular in mouse embryonic stem cells. ESC are pluripotent and are derived from blastocyst. It can virtually give rise to all the cell type for a given organism. For example, neuron, cardiomyocytes, skin, bone, etc., as you can see in the right picture. 
Picture to your left is mouse ESC, which can grow either on feeder or in feeder-free condition. Establishment of mouse ESC from mouse embryo was accomplished by Evans and Kaufman in 1981, which revolutionized the field of mouse genetics. There are several advantages of mouse ESC. Number one, mouse ESC are highly proliferative and doubles approximately 10 to 12 hours. That allows the researcher to generate plenty of cells in short duration of time. Number two, it is also very amenable for genetic manipulations because it is, it is hardy and it can sustain harsh electroporation conditions. In the next slide, I will describe about the utility of CRISPR-Cas9 in mouse genome engineering. Recently, CRISPR-Cas9 revolutionized the field of mouse genetics because of several reasons. Number one, one can rapidly generate knockout or knock-in mouse using microinjection of CRISPR-Cas9 to embryos. People have shown that multiple genes and gene family can be targeted simultaneously. This allows researchers to save tremendous amount of time and money in their research. Number two, you can easily create LOXP site in targeted mouse genome that allows researchers to use cre loxp system for conditional knockout in defined tissue at a specific time point during development. Number three, you can study cancer or find the gene for cancer metastasis using mouse model. Number four, one can also use CRISPR-Cas to generate makeup-based pair deletion in mouse genome for genetic studies, for example, to identify the function of non-coding genetic elements such as enhancers. As you might be aware that there are super enhancers that are very large in size. In next slide, I will talk about the workflow that we utilized for mouse ESC genome engineering. Described here is the workflow for mouse ESC genome engineering. First, mouse ESCs are grown on feeder, as shown in the top picture, for few passages, and then mouse ESCs are adapted to feeder-free condition for genome engineering experiments. We utilize CRISPR-Cas9 genome engineering tool for genomic modifications. First, target specific guide RNA are generated, and then we use guide RNA in combination with either Cas9 mRNA or Cas9 protein. Cells are transfected, and 48-hour post-transfection cells are analyzed using various methods. As shown in blue, one can use genomic cleavage detection assay or Sanger sequencing or next-generation sequencing to calculate the percentage of indels. Next step is to pick single clone and analyze for desired genotype. In next slide, I will talk about genome editing efficiency in mouse ESC using various CRISPR-Cas9 formats. Let me walk through the results of an editing experiment in mouse ESCs. We selected mouse Rosa 26 locus as it is used for various knock-in applications. We compared editing efficiency of various CRISPR-Cas9 formats. Top picture shows the cleavage efficiency of CRISPR DNA and mRNA formats. DNA was transfected using lipofectamin 3000, and mRNA format of CRISPR was transfected using lipofectamin messenger max. As shown below the picture, use of DNA format resulted in 30 to 32 percent cleavage, whereas mRNA format of CRISPR generated higher cleavage efficiency, 45 percent. Bottom picture describes about cleavage efficiency of CRISPR protein. In this format, we use guide RNA and Cas9 protein. Mouse ESC were electroporated with RNP complex using neon electroporation, and cells were collected at various time points, such as 1, 12, 24, 48, and 72 hours, as described on the top of the picture. Editing efficiency is shown below the picture. As you can see, editing efficiency of RNP is higher and also maximum editing efficiency is achieved at 24-hour post-electroporation. In addition to higher editing efficiency, RNP provides several other advantages, such as it is ready to use, there is no requirement of promoter, 
and there's no random integration in the genome. This slide describes about a new transfection reagent, lipofectamine CRISPR-Max, that allows the researcher to transfect CRISPR RNP complex into mouse embryonic stem cell. X-axis of war graph describes about two different concentration of Cas9 and guide RNA. Four different color of bar graph shows different amount of transfection reagent. Y-axis shows the percentage cleavage. As results indicate increased amount of RNP complex or increased amount of transfection reagent do not help in maximizing the editing efficiency. To maximize the editing efficiency, one should optimize the various transfection variables such as guide RNA and Cas9 protein amounts and various amount of transfection reagent. To your right, cell morphology and plating density of mouse C is shown in before transfection and 48 hour post transfection. Next, I will talk about human iPSC or ESCs. This slide describes about human ESC or iPSC workflow for genome engineering experiment. Initially, ESCs or IPC are grown on feeder and subsequently made feeder-free in condition medium. If cells are grown in feeder-free condition, then work workflow becomes more simpler. Cells are collected using cell harvesting reagents and single cell suspensions are either electroporated or plated for transfection reagent mediated genome editing. For electroporation, we use neon and one should first optimize neon electroporation condition for maximum editing efficiency. For transfection, we use either messenger max for mRNA or use CRISPR max for RNP mediated genome editing. We analyze cells 72 hour post transfection by genomic cleavage detection assay or by sequencing. This slide describes about editing efficiency in IPSC grown on feeder. We first made these cells feeder free prior to electroporation. Figure A describes about neon electroporation and cleavage efficiency. Out of 24 different preset electroporation conditions tested, some condition resulted in 60 to 70 percent cleavage efficiency, whereas some electroporation condition resulted in poor cleavage efficiency. Therefore, we recommend user to optimize electroporation condition for given cell type. In figure B, we are comparing various format of CRISPR-Cas9 and their cleavage efficiency. As shown in the figure, DNA and mRNA shows poor cleavage efficiency, whereas various concentration of Cas9 protein shows higher cleavage efficiency. In figure C, we tested the pluripotency of edited IPSC. We used SSCA4 and TRA160 as a marker for pluripotency. As you can see, IPSC edited with Cas9 mRNA and protein are positive for pluripotency markers. Next, I will talk about editing in IPSC or ESC that are grown feeder-free using essential aid medium. This slide describes editing efficiency of RNP in ESCs and IPSC grown in feeder-free condition, meaning cells were grown on gel tricks coated plate in essential aid medium. In this experiment, single cell suspension were collected and electroporated with RNPs. As you can see, both IPSC and H9 ESC show higher percentage of editing efficiency. In case of IPSC, we can achieve up to 83% editing efficiency, whereas H9 shows up to 64% editing efficiency. So far, I have talked about delivery of CRISPR-Cas9 using neon electroporation in IPSCs. Next, I will talk about delivery of CRISPR-Cas9 in IPSC using newly developed transfection reagent, lipofectamine CRISPR-Max. In this slide, I'm showing various factors that can affect RNP 
transfixin in iPSCs. Figure A describes optimal bleeding density before transfection for maximum editing efficiency. Figure B describes editing efficiency of mRNA and RNP format. As you can see, we can achieve between 35 to 50 percent editing efficiency in iPSC using RNPs and CRISPR Max transfection reagent. Figure C describes about presence of ROC inhibitor that can enhance the transfection and editing efficiency. Figure D compares triple and acutase cell harvesting reagent that can influence editing efficiency. As you can see, cells collected with triple shows better editing efficiency. Next, I will compare the cell survivability of various CRISPR format post-electroporation. In this experiment, we electroporated DNA, mRNA, and protein format of CRISPR-Cas9 and analyzed the cells 72 hours post-electroporation. As you can see, there were more number of colonies in iPSC electroporated with RMPs compared to iPSC electroporated with DNA format of CRISPR. Cells were also stained with alkaline phosphatase to show pluripotency status. Overall, RNP format shows higher editing and cell viability in iPSCs. Next, I will talk about single nucleotide polymorphism and how to use CRISPR to correct single nucleotide polymorphism. As you know, single nucleotide polymorphism are present in human genome, and some of these SNP are associated with diseases. In next slide, I will describe about presence of SNP in human genome. From genome-wide association studies, it is clear that many disease-causing SNP are located in human genome. Surprisingly, 93% of these SNP are located in non-coding region of human genome. Only 7% of disease-causing SNP are located in protein coding region. To study these SNP in cell-based model, one need to create isogenic cell lines using genome engineering tool to further validate the effect of SNP in human genome. Let me describe few human diseases associated with SNP in next slide. There are several human diseases associated with single nucleotide polymorphism. And in this slide, I have mentioned two of them, beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. Both these diseases are caused by single point mutation in human genome. Recently, researchers have used CRISPR or TALS to correct this mutation. For more detail, you can look into these publications shown next to the picture. Next, I will show our workflow for correcting point mutation in iPSCs. To create a single nucleotide polymorphism, we utilized the following workflow. First, we transfected cell with various control, such as CRISPR only, guide RNA only, Cas9 only, and also CRISPR Cas9 along with single standard oligos. There were two different kinds of single standard oligos, one with modified ends and one without any modification. 72 hour post transfection cells were collected and analyzed by genomic cleavage detection assay and also by sequencing. To find out the percentage SNP changes, one has to sequence PCR products and perform clonal isolation to get desired clones. Next, I will describe an example that we use to create SNP in human iPSCs. This slide describes about SNP correction at target loci. First, a target sequence is shown on the top with band sequence as GGG in red. Our goal is to change A into G using CRISPR-Cas and single standard oligos. We used two different kind of 100 base pair oligos, one with modified ends and other without any modification. Modified ends were used to 
protect it from the nucleases. As shown in the bar graph, we can achieve up to 24% SNP in human iPSCs without any modification on the oligos. Modification of oligo did not improve SNP efficiency. Gel picture to your left shows the cleavage efficiency of CRISPR-Cas9 in presence or absence of oligos. As you can see, we got up to 78% cleavage efficiency in iPSCs. Next, I will summarize this presentation. In summary, we have shown that guide RNA design to analysis of indel efficiency can be done in three to four days. Newly developed transfection reagent is highly efficient in delivering RNP complex to various cell types. Cas9 RNPs and electroporation enables multiple loci to be targeted simultaneously with high indel efficiency. Mouse and human embryonic stem cell can be edited with high efficiency using RNP-based CRISPR-Cas9 system. Using single standard oligos and CRISPR-Cas9, we can generate more than 20% SNP in targeted loci. To the end, I would like to acknowledge our team leader, John Chestnut, and all other group members for their guidance and support in developing highly efficient CRISPR-Cas9 system that will help researchers in performing their genome editing experiments. If you have more questions, then please do not hesitate to contact us, and we would be very happy to provide you more information. Thank you for your attention, and have a wonderful day.